Tanya. Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for waking up early, and uh, thanks for being here and uh, the interest in my talk. Appreciate that. I'm Peter. I work at uh, Stiftung Neue Verantwortung, um, a non-party charitable independent think tank in Berlin. Um, since we have a lot to talk about, uh, and I really want to talk with you uh, about many different issues, um, Talk to me later if you're interested in uh, what we're doing at the foundation, our work, uh, and what I do for a living. Um, to start with the topic, before the presentation is up, um, if you think about um, the online services that uh, Rika just, uh, just told us about, so Google, Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, Yahoo, Instagram, Snapchat, whatever you can think of. They obviously, um, thanks. They, they obviously um, play an important role in our daily lives. So imagine how you would communicate through the three days of Republica without any of those services. Some of you may do that because they're comfortable not using these services, but for a huge part of us, um, these services um, play a central part, part in our lives. So for me, it was interesting to look at what are the rules of the game for law enforcement to access the data of these services? Because obviously, since they are a central part of our lives, they play a central part often in crimes. And there may be relevant data in Facebook's private messages or Twitter messages or Instagram pictures that are relevant for an investigation. But at the same time, we have an international um, dimension because these are services that are hosted outside um, of Europe, outside of Germany. So why is that important? Well, as I told you, the, since they, they play such a central role, if the rules of the game are outdated, there may be human rights violations. So, for example, if there's a lack of transparency, how law enforcement may access this data, or um, if they, they are not accountable to what, what they are doing. So, up to date, as with, with ev every other uh, aspect of the internet, up to date rules and up to date laws that really focus on, the, on central issues are extremely relevant. Another issue is that. The US is aware of this problem, that we tr um, are working with outdated legal frameworks and outdated um, rules, so to speak. And they are updating these right at the moment. Um, it's, of course, a long process. It's not like after the uh, Republica, everything is done and, and set. Um, but um, the striking thing for me is that they're deciding rules for the rest of the world because it's essentially how foreign law enforcement agencies may access data that is stored in the US. And they're doing it for the rest of the world, and the, the rest of the world is sadly silent. So there's very little engagement, very, very little knowledge um, about this, uh, this issue. And thirdly, even if you think that, well, if it's, if it's outdated for law enforcement, that's a good thing because that means law enforcement doesn't use it and they don't get access to, to our data so easily. Well, you're mistaken because what happens is if they are not using these legal frameworks, they try other mechanisms. So you see a lot of um, data localization so that Brazil says to Facebook, if you want to do this business uh, in our country, you have to store the data in, um, inside our country. Um, another aspect is um, the extraterritorial reach of laws. And I know it's early. You perhaps didn't have your first Club Mate yet. Um, I had a little bit too much. So extraterritorial reach of laws may sound a bit complicated, and it is, but it basically means that the US says, we don't care where the server is as long as the company is headquartered in the US, we have access to the server. It doesn't matter if it's in Ireland or Singapore um, or Croatia, we have access to it. And that means that you have a law that before was only relevant in your own ju jurisdiction, and suddenly you say, well, it's, it's basically legal all over the world. So I jumped ahead and I 
talked already, already about the bad implications and why it's relevant. But what the heck are we actually talking about? Well, the wonderful name is Mutual Legal Assistance Process. I like the word. You, you, you may not like it. Um, but hopefully, in the next 20 minutes, you will understand that it's a very important phrase, a very important word. And basically, it just means that there might be international crime. So someone from country A did a um, crime in country B, and country B investigates and needs the help of country A to find this thief or whatever. And this is old. This is nothing new to the internet. Um, there have been international dimensions to crimes since hundreds of, or even thousands of, of, of years ago. Um, the tricky thing is that these mutual legal assistance processes or treaties um, are just as old as this. They are decades old. And they were written in a, with a mindset that didn't think about a global network that reaches every corner of the, of the earth and could directly connect um, everybody. So I told you it's a wonderful word, and it's as long as the word is, as long as this entire process. So we start from the left and go all the way to the right, and then we are at the right and we go all the way back to the left. I could take the next 10 minutes to explain you the process, but I think since it's not even 11 a.m., and um, I really want you to, to understand the issue. I think it's better not to use this visualization, but the most w beautiful visualization I could think of, and that's you. So let's do a game. You are all, the audience is all Germany. And here at my stage, I'm the yes. And there's a crime, so I need a villain. Who wants to be a thief or a robber? Just, you, don't need to have, you don't need to do anything. You don't need to stand up. You just need to raise your hand. Who wants to be? Perfect. You over there. You over lane. Awesome. What did you do? You stole. I already thought of it, so don't, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> um, you stole this nice car um, downstairs. Did you see this nice car, this um, silver one? Looks awesome. He stole it. Sorry. So who wants to be a police officer? You were there. Awesome. Police officer. So you're a German police officer, and you saw that he was bragging about stole, stealing this car, uh, which was stupid that he bragged about it on, on Twitter. Um, so you have a lead. You have a Twitter account, and you want to look into this Twitter account. Who wants to be, perhaps for the first time in uh, his or her life, a judge? A German judge. You were there with a yellow scarf. Awesome. You're the judge. So. We need one more um, person, and that's the Ministry of Justice. So you're all people, but one of you can be an entire ministry. Who wants to be a ministry? You're over there. Awesome. So Ministry of Justice, judge, thief, and police officer. You're all German. That's the US. Don't, don't come here. That's the US. Um, so you stole the car. You're investigating. And suddenly, there is an international um, dimension to this crime because there may, be, there may be proof on Twitter that he actually stole the car and there, that he was perhaps, perhaps not acting alone, but there, that there were, was a gang of car stealers, who might imagine. So you go to our wonderful judge and say, well, here's proof that I have enough evidence to access this, this kind of data. She writes a court order, and she goes to the Ministry of Justice and says, well, we need the help of the yes to solve this crime. And the Ministry of Justice says, well, I have a very nice uh, process for this. It's called mutual legal assistance process. It's very quick. So the Ministry of Justice goes to me, to the yes. I'm, I'm multiple parts here. So goes to the Ministry of Justice, uh, the Department of Justice, to the yes, I get the thing. She translated it because I don't speak German, I only speak English. Um, and I, I get this uh, court order. And then I give it to the US attorney in California because Twitter sits in California. And then the US attorney in California gives it to the court, to the district court. 
uh, in California of the district where the Twitter headquarters sits. And then it uh, gets, goes to the FBI, and every single stage this court order is, is analyzed, uh, if it's correct, if it's uh, specific enough, and so on. And then in the last instant, the FBI hands over the court order to the company, to Twitter. And then all the WebEx. So the company produces the data, gives it to the FBI. The FBI minimizes the data and sees um, if it's relevant. Then it has, it's at the district court, then at the US Attorney of California, then at the Department of Justice. And now comes your time. I hand it back to you. You hand it back to her. She hands it back to him. And he has this data. It was, it was really quick, right? It was, it was like pfft, painless. What do you think? How long does this process take? What? One year. You're very close. Very good guess. On average, it takes 10 months. So next time we meet at this stage, perhaps I can give you the data. It, it doesn't really, if you think about um, Berlin startups, sometimes don't last for 10 months. So, it seems like an, a really antiquated uh, process. And what's, what's the problem? Well, it's a slow process based on really old treaties. Second thing is, it's, there's, so basically, there's no definition outside of the yes of what a probable cause is. And you need probable cause, it's a legal definition, to access data, to access content. And this is a problem to the point that uh, even the um, Council of the European Union wrote extensively about this issue that there is no concept of probable cause inside the EU. And it's a very, it's, it's a very big struggle for um, European courts or for German courts, for German judges, um, to, to, to agree to this uh, probable cause. Third thing, it's a black box. So, once you started this process and you um, hand over the data, you don't really know where it's stuck. So um, in the last two years, there was a lot of investigation, a lot of questioning and um, interviews. And we found out that uh, one of the central issues is this probable cause, that the um, Department of Justice has to constantly go back to the foreign judge and say, well, it's, it's, it's not enough. You, you don't have enough proof to reach this probable cause. Um, so we need more proof. And then the judge goes back to, the, um, to our wonderful police officer, and he has to provide, provide more proof. And that's, that takes a long time. And of course, since a lot of companies are sitting in, um, in California, the district courts are actually um, over, um, have too much to do with all the requests, um, because all the companies are sitting in, in this area. And lastly, because of all the, th um, all the four points, it's obvious that it doesn't scale. In the, in the age of the internet, in the age of the cloud, where we use these kind of services on a, on a daily basis, this process doesn't work. So the question that um, civil society, and uh, especially US civil society um, and US companies, asked over the last, I would say, two years, academics for, for uh, a lot longer, how can we fix the process? How, how can we make it scale so that in the long run it's useful again? The cops are not trying to, to circumvent it. Um, national governments don't try to circumvent it with data localization and what I told you before, the extraterritorial reach of laws. And one of the most concrete proposals how to fix this is called the Daskal Woods proposal. It's very simple. It's a Jennifer Daskal, um, a US um, law professor, and Andrew Woods, another US law professor. And what they basically do is they say, well, if your country has a minimum set of, of human rights, then we skip the entire U.S. court, U.S. Department of Justice, uh, U.S. Um, attorney um, part of the, of, of the game. And the foreign court, so our foreign judge over there, can directly access 
the, the com uh, request the company in the US and ask for, for data. This, this speeds up the process, absolutely. Um, at the same time, we get rid of, of probable cause. Um, so they try to um, make the minimum human rights standard as high as possible so that you don't need probable cause anymore. And at the same time, since I told you these old treaties, they are really intransparent, unaccountable. They try to fix that too. So um, to make mandatory reporting by governments, how many requests they did per year, um, how su successful they were, um, for which types of, types of crime, and so on. But it's, it's not a silver bullet, because if you think about this, this takes a long time, but it's actually a lot of eyes that look on the specific court order and decide if it's enough to provide the data or not. And if you get rid of all of that, there's not, not much left. So it, it streamlines, it certainly streamlines the process, but um, it's not by, by far shot not a silver bullet. Because if you, if you think about it, how do you agree transnationally on minimum human rights standards? So there might be countries that have very good standards for, um, for child abuse, but they have very poor human rights protection for thievery or robbery or money laundering or whatever. So suddenly you have to think about, well, it's not one universal human rights, uh, minimum human rights standard, but you actually have to think in terms of um, categories of crime. And then you end up with a weird matrix where you say, well, it's okay to work with this uh, country as long as it's not thievery or um, religious free, sp free speech. And if it's okay to work with this country, um, if it's um, child abuse, but nothing else. And it's, it's really complicated. And again, just um, what I told you before, the probable cause is really tricky, but it's a really high standard. So it's actually a very good protection for our content. So with that proposal, and it, uh, it has been, it came up like middle of last year, it has been uh, discussed um, amongst mainly US civil society, um, US Department of Justice, there was a, s a Senate hearing uh, in the US that talked about this, this issue. So the US is slowly picking up on the issue and they slowly understand all the, all the dimensions, but the problem is they're talking amongst themselves. They're talking with other US companies with other US civil societies to decide what would be best for the rest of the world. And that, that doesn't sound like the right process. But you can only partly blame them because you, especially European civil society is, is fairly silent. There, there was um, a, few month, a few weeks ago, there was a um, conference call and a meeting um, in the UK where Privacy International was involved and, and other organizations. But that was, that was a very small share um, of, of the European NGOs, not to speak of international, so not EU um, NGOs, for, for whom that, this would be really relevant. So yes, there might be a lot of problems, and um, there might be a lot of obstacles to take, and we should be very careful to get rid of probable cause, and we should be very careful to cite what is the minimum human rights standard to access our, our data that is stored in the, in the US by a US company. But at the same time, we have the chance to really improve the process. Because if we get it right, if we involve more non-US civil society NGOs, if we involve more academics that are not US, then we, we really have the chance to make it faster and more responsive so that the police actually has to use it and cannot, the governments cannot circumvent it by saying, well, the process is broken, we have to do data localization or we have to apply our laws extraterritorially. We can make it transparent and accountable. Um, as I said, there um, in the Daska Woods um, proposal, there's also the mentioning of, of sanctions, uh, of independent audits, um, if you um, comply with the, um, uh, with the proposal. And essentially, it's, if you think about it, why in, in our scenario where he stole the car 
and a German police officer investigated, why should we play by US law if it's a crime completely inside Germany or completely outside of the US? So suddenly, just because he stored the picture on Twitter, suddenly we have to agree to US law. And that doesn't make sense. Even if it's, if it's a good law and for other company, uh, countries uh, it might better protect the human rights uh, than their own standards, for a lot of countries it doesn't make sense. So in my opinion it's better to come up with international standards, minimum human rights um, protection, or the best human rights protection we can think of, um, and have a really international approach instead of just playing by, by the rules the US decides. With that, I um, come to a full turn. And um, if you think about our wonderful police officer who waited for 10 months, desperately hoping to get this evidence um, to find the, the, the real um, responsible guy, the lines from Adele's song, Hello from the Other Side, I must have called a thousand times, suddenly seem very fitting. <laughs> Thank you very much. Do, do we have time for questions? Yeah. Awesome. Three Any questions? questions? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, your talk was really interesting to me. I have just one question about the lack of definition of probable cause. Because um, you said it's a mutual agreement. And I would guess that this indicates that when some US authorities come to a German company, uh, to a German court, they have to apply a legal standard as well. How can it be then that there is no definition in Germany? Or what do the German courts apply then? I'm, I'm actually no legal expert. Uh, I'm an information scientist and uh, communication theory. Um, but what I understood from the, from the talks with um, US lawyers and with European lawyers, um, and again what the uh, Council of the European Union wrote in their reports, um, the, of course they understand what probable cause means, but it's sometimes hard to um, quickly adapt this concept um, to, a, uh, to a German um, uh, case, or to an to a Italian case, or to a, basically to a case outside um, of, the, um, of the US, because for every case it might, you might need different evidence, um, and the, the threshold of probable cause might be proven in a different way. You, you understand what I mean? Yeah. yeah thank you. One, one more question, maybe? Oh, over there. Um, would, it, would it be fair to say that human rights are never going to top economical interests? So, I mean, to, to get this through, human rights would have to be more important than economic interests like U.S. interests. Well, the, that's the thing. I, um, I don't. I don't think there is a lot of um, a lot of economic interest um, because what happens in a mutual, mutual legal assistance process is is that you ask another country for help in an investigation and you don't compensate them for for, for this. So actually, the U.S. has an incentive to update and stre streamline this process um, because at the moment it this. This old process just creates a lot of costs. But the, the tricky part is, if we don't have a voice in this, they will streamline it just out of efficiency and in, a, in an economic way. But we have a chance to streamline it and at the same time make it more accountable um, and have a strong human rights protection in there. But it's only, it, it will only happen if we find a voice, if we engage the, the, um, the, the, the US parts. I think there was maybe one last question over there. It's okay? Okay, so uh, thank you, Jan-Peter Kleinhans, for this very insightful talk. Uh, 
I hope all of us now know what's about mutual legal assistance processes. Awesome. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. Give a warm applause.